Well, good morning, church. Glad to have you in here with us today and uh, glad to worship with you. Psalm 5, verses 7 and 8 says this. But I, by your great love, can come into your house in reverence, and I bow down toward your holy temple. Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies, and make your way straight before me. We are here in a place where we're asking God to make our way straight, and we bow down before him in his temple and in his holy place. And so, church, let us pray together as we come to the Lord in prayer, uh, as we come to the Lord in worship. Yes. Father, we are here to serve you and you alone. We are here for your glory. We are here for your honor. And so, God, may we not turn our attention and our focus to the other things of this world, to ourselves, to others, to the worries that we bring in to this place, Lord, but instead may this be a place where your name is lifted up and, and made holy and, and made a, above all other things and above all other names. God, may we worship you here with no hindrance. For it is in a, that wonderful, blessed name of Jesus that we pray all of these things together. Amen. Amen. Yes. Now, church, would you stand? Let's sing of our great God. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. 
Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before the lion and the Song to 
you are Lord, you are King, you are our Savior, and you are here with us today. We believe it. We love you. We say it together as your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want you to take this time now. I want you to stand, find someone, shake their hand, greet them this morning in the love of the Lord. We'll come back and share some announcements with you. Good morning, church. Good morning. 
Again, we're glad that you're here. My name is uh, Pastor Daniel. I'm here at Louisville Grace Community Church of the Nazarene. I wanted to share a couple of announcements with you today before we uh, get back into a time of worship. We've also got some, uh, we got a, well, just something neat I'm going to share with you here in just a little bit. I do want to share with you a uh, first announcement. If you have not already heard, uh, hopefully you have already heard, but in just in case you need a reminder, we are having our uh, trunk or treat uh, festivities on Thursday, which is Halloween the 31st. We're going to be having our trunk or treat from 530 to 830. That is uh, right in between those hours, a sandwich, the actual trick or treat hours that kids observe uh, in, in this area. And so uh, we want to make this uh, an incredible outreach in our community. Community. We've already had several people that have signed up outside for a trunk. If you have not signed up to host a trunk, uh, decorate it up, fill it with candy for trick or treaters to come by. I want to urge you to do so if, you, if at all possible uh, because this really is a way that we put our best foot forward in our community. Let them know that we care invested in their lives and invested in the things we do. And so even if you don't have a car, get, well, we've got a church van, I've got a car, we, we've got several things. If you want to decorate a trunk <laughs> for Trunk or Treat, we want to get as many people out there. I think we've already got seven or eight uh, that are signed up, and we'd love to see so many more. So uh, enjoy that. There's also sign-ups outside for volunteer roles. We're going to have apple cider and uh, popcorn and a, and a few other things. So check it out. The sign-ups out in the lobby on the table. If you can be a part of that, please be a part of it. Uh, uh, this is this is a great way to meet your neighbors out here in the surrounding area. Also want to invite you to our Thanksgiving dinner that's going to be uh, on uh, November 10th uh, following service. It is sort of the same idea as our normal uh, second Sunday dinners except for it's Thanksgiving themed so bring Thanksgiving sides. It's a sort of a potluck idea. I believe there will be turkey provided but we want all the sides and the fixings. Let's enjoy that together as well uh, on November 10th. 10th. Also, uh, I do want to let you know if you have been or you're planning on filling a box uh, for um, Operation Christmas Child, those boxes will be due on November 17th. Uh, I know we'll be showing a little more information soon about exactly what those boxes do, how to pack them, uh, and I think that'll be during our Wednesday Bible study if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but <clears throat> We think it's a worthwhile cause, and honestly, this, this is the best gift that some kids get in their entire lifetime. And so we'd hope that you would want to be a part of that. If you've already got a box, it's due November 17th. And now this morning, I have uh, something that makes my heart very happy uh, that I'd like to share with you this morning. I'm going to call uh, my wife, Rachel, up uh, to the front, and I'll share with you why that is the case. If you'll come down here with me. You don't think my microphone? I, I think my microphone's on. It's good. Uh, so uh, the last meeting of our church board, um, Rachel expressed to our leaders uh, her great desire for God to use her in ministry. Um, I'm not sure how many of you knew that Rachel had a call to ministry, but she's always had a always had a heart for it from the time that she was a teenager, and it is expressed uh, in a tangible way today as we celebrate the. Uh, Really, the, the the giving of your first your first official uh, Nazarene local minister's license. Now, normally I would have that license in hand. I have a pretend license in my hand this morning because sometimes the mail doesn't operate the way it's supposed to. But she is, uh, as of really as of the time of that board meeting and today, we want to celebrate that she is a local minister in the Church of the Nazarene, and she will be involved in ministry and teaching. Uh, and preaching and all the things under the leadership of, of this church and under the, the pastoral leadership of this church and going through the process from this day forward uh, unto ordination through the Church of the Nazarene. So this is a very special day for me and um, it means that we really are a team in ministry as we go through this together and I'm just really excited about that. So at first, I wanted to tell you that first and foremost. And second of all, I want you as a church to rally around Rachel and her call to ministry, to confirm that call, to see her, uh, uh, to, to help her grow in this. And also, I want you, I'm going to call everyone forward that's able to stand uh, to come. We want to pray over Rachel this morning uh, as we really launch her into ministry from this day forward. And I'm going to ask our... Uh, our steam district superintendent, Brian Powell, and a very good friend of ours um, to lead this prayer with us. This should work just fine right here. Rachel, I'm going to ask that you and Daniel would kneel over here at the altar. 
and um, and allow uh, the board members especially to come and gather around her, everybody, yeah, but and just lay your hands on her. Theologian Jer Jergon Mot Moltmann says, um, without women, <laughs> Without women preachers, we would have no knowledge of the resurrection. <laughs> uh, it was it was them that took took the word of Christ rising again from the dead promptly back to all the men who were hiding in fear, and so uh, and we thank we thank God for that. And um, they 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 were the ones, and God has used the woman at the well and used so many others to just to preach the gospel, to share the gospel. And so we thank God for that. And I've known Rachel for a long time, and I know, um, I know the call that's on her life. So let's pray for them. Lord, I thank you for Rachel, and I thank you for the call to, um, Lord, to minister beside her husband. Lord, not just to, uh, not just to play the, the typical support role uh, in the church. And, Lord, sometimes I see the strain that gets put on marriage in some of uh, the churches and some of the demands of ministry. Yes. And I think it's a beautiful thing, God, when you, um, when you uh, bring them together in, in a way that is under the umbrella of the call. And so, God, I thank you for Pastor Daniel. I thank you for Rachel. And today she receives uh, her local minister's license, which is the beginning of a new journey, God. It's the beginning of uh, a new part of training, a new part of education. Uh, Lord, a new, uh, a new level of, yes. of commitment to the kingdom work that is before her. Lord, she comes from a family where ministry is, uh, is very much been a part of her life, all of her life. And so, God, I pray that you'd bless her to walk in the footsteps of those that's gone before her. And, God, that she would always be humble and submissive to the call and obedient to your word as you walk with her. And remind her every day regularly, Lord, that the gifts and the calling of God yes. are without repentance. Meaning, God, that you don't change your mind yes. about uh, who you call us to be and what you call us to do. Amen. You have created us fearfully and wonderfully in your image. Oh, and you. so, God, I pray that Rachel would reflect reflect that uh, in a humble and meek way all the days of her life. Yes, we give you praise, Amen. honor, and glory for what you've done here today in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you, church. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Church, we respond. There's so much we have to be thankful for today, so much that we have to give him praise for. And I'm going to call our, our ushers forward at this time, and we're going to receive our tithes and our offerings. Knowing that this is not in something, uh, something in addition to our worship that we do, this is not uh, something we just throw into a worship service to keep the lights on. This is a spiritual act of worship. This is uh, an act of surrender to him and so we surrender everything to him today knowing that he blesses us beyond measure so church would you pray Lord we're here for you this morning in so many ways and you've already poured yourself out on us and so God may we simply give back what you've asked in obedience and in worship with a humble spirit Lord may this be a joy for us to give to you it's in Jesus name we pray all of these things church said amen against the earth till my heart it rises over my head as the weed it bows down low when the autumn wind blows I kneel before the one I love so find me grateful find me thankful Singing, 
the dust that you first held in a garden where you knelt. Pull me up against your face again. Till the breath of your hope fills the depths of my soul. Till all I know is I've been found by love. So find me grateful. Find me thankful. Find me on my knees. So find me dreaming. Find me singing. Find me lost in your grace. So like the dust that you first held in a garden where you me up against your face again, till the breath of your hope fills the depths of my soul, till all I know is I've been found by love, oh, so find me grateful, find me faithful, find me on my Dreaming, find me singing, find me lost in your grace. So find me grateful, find me thankful, find me on my knees. So find me dreaming, find me singing. in your grace. Church. <laughs> Church, would you stand as we continue to invite the Holy Spirit into this place? <laughs> There's nothing worth more that will ever come close nothing can compare you are our living hope your presence i've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more. Never come close, nothing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves. My heart becomes free, and my shame is undone. In your presence, Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come for this place and fill me. Bye. 
become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. To be overcome by your presence,
Amen. You can be seated. He is holy. He is wonderful. He is so good to us. He is the author of all blessings. He is the one that we adore and the one that we come to today. The one that I call upon for the strength to preach this morning. So thankful for him. I'm so thankful for what he does for us and in us and through us. And I pray that he will continue to be the one who does that in the days ahead. This morning I continue a, a series through the book of 1 Timothy. And we're in a chapter 2 today, and before I read anything, before I say anything else, I just want to ask his blessing uh, on the message today. And so, uh, if you care to join me, I'd love if you would pray with me. Father, the, the weight of being in the pulpit is it's ever-present. And God, I, I don't ever want that to go away, because it's, <laughs> there's a lot of weight behind your word. But it is also a weight that is freeing. It's so a it is a, a weight that is powerful, and honestly, God, it, it, is, it is something that is used for your good and your glory. And so use it for your good and your glory today. God, would you amplify the words that I say today and make them so much more than my words? God, would your spirit be in our hearts? God, would it translate in our ears? And God, would it find good soil in all of us? We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So uh, as I said last week, we started this new series, A Matter of Tim, and uh, wanted to uh, just sort of uh, catch you up if you uh, missed it last week to let you know what we talked about in week one. And really the gist of it is that we can, we can study and we can speculate and we can memorize and we can debate and we can otherwise dissect every single detail of Scripture and still miss its heart and even into things that are not there cause damage to the church by speculating too much on Scripture. You see, it's the gospel put on display in a changed life that is the greatest testimony, and it is for this same reason that God put Jesus on display as a fulfillment of the law rather than people following the letter of the law and finding themselves condemned by the law. Jesus was the ultimate fulfillment and ultimate example of what it means to live by God's holy ordinance. So this week, Paul's focus shifts to instructing Timothy on some basics of conduct and order in the worship service. As observed in Scripture from the time of Jesus and through the book of Acts, uh, you know, with the apostles doing the things they did, the communal worship service was thrown into a bit of disarray. It was nothing like they had experienced before and nothing like what they had expected upon the arrival of their Messiah. It was, uh, it was disorderly, and sometimes there was a lot of contention between uh, folks that were just entering this, this worship with God, the Jews and the Gentiles, men and women. It was this incredible mix, and it was beautiful, but it was messy. Everyone was included in the same worshiping body for the very first time, and that came with great freedom, yet also with great difficulty as these previously separate groups were trying to find out how they may worship together in peace. Enter the Apostle Paul and his advice to Timothy in chapter 2. We're going to start with the first seven verses and read that together. I read out of the New International Version. You may have a different one. Uh, if you'd rather follow along on the screen, the words are available up on the screen as well. And so uh, this is the word from the Apostle Paul to Timothy. He says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. <clears throat> this is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. There's that word again, all. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I'm not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. We'll stop there momentarily. 
Now, I won't spend a whole lot of time here in this passage, but it is important for us to note, <laughs> and I think this is a very relevant word for us today, God desires for us to pray for leaders everywhere. Like them, dislike them, entirely loathe them, it does not matter. God urges us to pray for leaders everywhere. And, and, and Paul says in, in verse 3, this is good and pleases God our Savior. So guess what? Pray for all leaders at all times, not just the ones that you have a liking toward. And don't pray like this, God get them. <laughs> I feel like the church has uh, got a little bit of that in that. Pray for every leader in office or power. Prayer, especially if his people are united, is a powerful tool. It is a powerful weapon wielded by the people of God to go penetrate into people's lives and change them from the very core of who they are. The natural outflow from this petition is the truth that the Lord wishes to save all. <laughs> Now, can I tell you, when you read it in English, it means that in the original language as well. All. It, every single person, it is God's desire to see saved. So we've gotten to a place, I think societally, uh, politically, where we really, really just, ooh, we can't stand certain politicians. We want to see them get their comeuppance. We want to see them get exactly what they deserve, and we rejoice at their downfall when they find something that incriminates them, something that will uh, remove them from power, something that will destroy their lives and their family. We're almost like, yeah, yeah, all right, we're excited about that. We want to see them be outed for the liars, cheaters, and scammers that they are. Now imagine, just for a second, taking the advice of Paul here in verses 1 through 7. Imagine if the church turned the same energies that they generally use to vilify politicians and turned those energies instead to praying for their salvation. What kind of difference that that would make? <clears throat> Could you imagine if that one that you think is an opponent to the church everywhere became the most powerful voice for the church instead? It already happened once. He wrote the letter that we're, <laughs> that we're reading this morning. Amen. It can happen, and it will happen, if the church continues to pray. Pray for every... Now, now here's the thing. Don't just pray for every leader. Pray for every kind of leader. From all walks and all thoughts, in the same way. <laughs> hmm. This is just the precursor to the main part of the message, just so you guys know. Every politician is his creation. Every leader is his creation. Every person that ever existed is his creation and his child, and he wants to see them redeemed. They are a child of God that, desires to know, that God desires to know and save, without exception. Now it is my hope... <laughs> It is my hope that no matter your leanings, that no one in the church finds this command objectionable. Even if there are those that you may believe are your enemy, to pray for your enemy is a core teaching of Jesus Christ. It's very difficult to slip by that in the scriptures. This is not a new revelation. The next passage, however, is, let's say, maybe a little more controversial. <clears throat> We're going to get into that here in just a moment. I, I want to start just by reading verse 8, because at really, Paul begins to shift from, from the kind of prayers that we need to go through to really what it looks like to maintain an orderly uh, worship service. Again, I told you there was this incredible mix of Jews and Gentiles and men and women where before uh, really what they'd been used to and, and what the, the, the teachers uh, had gotten used to was just a worship service with Jewish men in it. Can you imagine when the church is launched how that can throw the church into a tizzy when you have people that are eating all kinds of weird foods and you have people that have all kinds of weird religious practices and people that didn't grow up reading the Torah and then you, uh, and then you 
you throw the, the women into that, and the women haven't even been uh, brought up in the, in the law and all these kinds of things, and then it's just, it's just this mess. And Paul is saying, Timothy, all right, I'm going to have you lead this church in Ephesus. You're going to be one of my main guys there. I need you to know how to conduct and order this worship service. And so he begins in verse 8 by saying this. He says, Therefore I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. Let's just talk about that verse for a moment. <clears throat> See, in this, Paul's giving guidelines for keeping order, and without leadership, without direction, worship, as I said, would be pure chaos. And so in order to keep the attention on God, on God there are some things that Timothy is saying to him that we should mind, or that the church in Ephesus should mind uh, from Paul's wisdom. And the first is for men to keep their personal matters and their disputes out of the worship service. I don't know about you, but I've seen this before. <laughs> And let me tell you, when there is a dispute between members of the church, even if they're not talking about it, you can feel it. And it changes the entire tenor, the atmosphere of worship. Because where there is contention, it's very hard for the Holy Spirit to dwell. So Paul senses this, and he wants to say, listen, especially in this day and age when, when, when worship is already chaotic enough, we can't have you not, not liking each other. We can't have you with things between you and stuff that you are stewing on, keeping in your mind, keeping in your heart, that thing that you just can't get off your mind, ooh, I can't stand my neighbor, or I can't stand this guy, and then come into the, the house of God and hope to have any sort of concentration on the things that matter. Therefore, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands, without anger or disputing. Men, women, families at odds with one another, faces of stone, arms crossed, other members of the church dragged into the drama. Whew. That can really mess up an atmosphere of worship in a church. Nothing kills the worship service like palpable tension between worshipers. And Paul says, when you come into this place, Timothy, I'm going to make sure that you attend to this. When people come into this place, that junk stays at the door. Or better yet, don't leave it at the door. Lay it at the feet of Jesus. Remember why you are here. You can't give your full devotion to God if you're still stewing about your brother or your sister. And worse yet, if you've carried an open dispute into the sanctuary, you have taken your issue and you have elevated it to a place of your life. And there is nothing that belongs in that spot. Your neighbors can't worship the same in that environment. So that's, that's something you need to be mindful of as you come into the sanctuary. That's what Paul is saying. And now Paul turns to the ladies and begins to share some additional guidelines for order and worship. And this is going to kind of go, ooh, you're going to read this. and Because <clears throat> especially in light of what we just did, right? We just prayed over my wife, who is a licensed minister now in the Church of the Nazarene. This is what Paul says to Timothy. <laughs> Starting in verse 9, it says, I also want the women to dress modestly, with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. So far, so good. That's, that's all right. Verse 11, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. He says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Whew. Okay, that's a lot to unpack. <clears throat> So 
So Paul begins with instruction for ladies for modest dress, for quiet learning, and then goes on to say he doesn't permit a woman to teach or hold a position of authority uh, in the church in Ephesus over men. But wait, what are we doing? <laughs> We've got ordained ladies all over the place in the church in the Nazarene. Did we miss 1 Timothy chapter 2? Did we just skip over that? What happened? Huh. These words from Paul present quite the conundrum for the modern Bible reader. How do we slough over that? How do we overlook that? How do we ignore that and continue to have women in authority in the church? Many denominations of Christianity as a result of this passage <laughs> will bar women from holding pastoral positions and it's a little bit understandable why. We just had a major controversy in the church. You may or may not have heard of it. There was a popular pastor and uh, a theologian that uh, denounced uh, women ministers and there was a big uprising about it and, and, uh, and it really ruffled some feathers and uh, I just want you to know that the enemy uses even that kind of stuff to really cause division in the church. We see Paul's, Paul's order for worship probably would have helped in that as well. You see, it looks like that on the surface, but I believe that that position is a result of lazy interpretation of Scripture. As always, these things were not written in a vacuum. These words are written in a place and in a time and in a specific context. And we have to understand the, the whole tenor of Scripture if we want to understand the words that Paul is saying to Timothy. To Timothy alone, by the way. Timothy in the church as an instruction. Scripture always has context. There is a before and an after. There's a story before it and a story after it. There are people involved. There's geography involved. There are relationships involved. Scripture alone is not idle words in a vacuum. And so we have to understand where Paul is writing this from and why. The first thing is to take into, into to mind the chronological context or the, the period and time in which this was written. See, studies seem to indicate that the, the church in Ephesus was still very, very young, less than 10 years old at this point during this writing. As the apostles were going out and launching churches in, in different places, they were starting new churches, again, uh, maybe with a, a base uh, level of people who had a synagogue in a certain area and really started to build it up from there. Sometimes they started brand new churches. This church itself was still feeling out what worship was like with women, and Gentiles as part of the mix, kind of the same idea we talked about before. It was a brand new idea having all of these people in one place at one time worshiping, worshiping the, the God of the Jews, the one who had just brought all of these other people into the fold. You see, in the Jewish synagogue, before all of this took place, before the church was launched, before uh, they went out, Jewish boys were reared with an education centered around the understanding of the Torah. And all of them, at least at the beginning, were, were sort of candidates to become rabbis and to learn and teach under rabbis. They were all sort of given this base Jewish education where they knew that, and even memorized scriptures in, in various uh, different ways. Girls and women were generally not educated. Instead, they were instructed in care for the home and the family. Think of that what you will. That's what the societal norm was at the time. Now, in a church that had just existed for a few years, you're taking women who had been separate. You're putting them in a place, an equal worship setting, and there is quite the disparity of understanding between men and women in the church in Ephesus. Not unequal in personhood, but unequal in understanding and training and preparation to be part of this service. And so Paul says in verse 8, first of all, remember, Paul, what he wants most of all in Ephesus is order because it can be chaos in the church. And so he starts in verse 8 by saying, men, don't you bring your junk into this place. It's already crazy enough. Come in here without dispute and lift your hands in prayer. That's what I require of you, men. Now, ladies... I've got some guidelines for you, some things that are going to be uh, a little different. So he says, I want the men to pray without dispute. And in verse 11, what he's saying to them is he's saying, women, take this time, sit back and learn. 
take in what is happening in the worship environment. It would be natural for a newcomer to have lots and lots of questions. You come into a place, I remember, and listen, I, you know, I've been in the church before, but I've... Um, one thing that I still have a lot of questions about is when I go to maybe like a Catholic Mass or something like that, and there's all kinds of different things that I'm not used to, and I'm tempted when I'm with someone to start asking questions like, what do we do now? Or are we supposed to stand? Or are we supposed to sit? That kind of stuff. And I can imagine someone going, shh. <laughs> I would be completely out of my element. Now imagine if half of the church... <laughs> was suddenly out of their element and they had so many questions about the church and how things operate and what does he mean when he says this out of the Torah and, and how do I take that and how do I interpret that? He says, ladies, this is a time for you to sit back and absorb the word, okay? I know you've got a lot of questions, but she should observe and listen and learn quietly in this setting about the scripture and teaching, about worship, about everything. Paul says, ladies, you're new to this. Take some time, submit to the teaching, and quietly learn. And then he also says, I, I believe it's, it's verse um, 12 here, he says, uh, I don't permit a woman to teach her to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. He's saying, don't try to take the helm and teach this too early. Soak it in. That's not the entirety of of Paul's message there, but that's one of the things that they're dealing with coming into this, is knowing the time and place in which this letter is written. You want to know something else that the people in Ephesus had to deal with? They had to deal with this. I don't know if you got a picture of it. It's the, yeah, it's the Temple of Artemis. Now, you may not know a whole lot about this, but the, the Temple of Artemis, it was, it was one of the grandest temples built uh, in, in the whole area. And, and, and Greek mythology, they had various uh, gods and, and a pantheon of gods that they, that they worshipped, but Artemis was, she was the goddess of the hunt, she was the goddess of nature and the wild, and she was the goddess of fertility. They worshipped at the temple of Artemis, it was dedicated to Artemis, and a major part of Greek worship at this temple was the employment of hundreds and hundreds of temple prostitutes. <laughs> Engagement in sexual acts in the temple of Artemis was a normal part of being a worshiper at the temple of Artemis. And this was one of the largest and grandest and most celebrated temples in all of Greece. And, and, uh, and it was also in one of the most culturally refined areas. It was a center of commerce. It was a center of wealth. There were so many wealthy people in Ephesus. They were well-to-do, and boy, they liked going to the temple. And so uh, Ephesus, it was, it was this, this incredibly rich uh, place, and prostitutes were no exception. They would dress in extravagant fashions. They would uh, gussy themselves up as much as they could with over-the-top hairstyles. They would cover themselves in expensive jewelry. They would unashamedly carry out the necessities of temple worship with the finest of garb. It gives you a little bit of context for what Paul says in verses 9 and 10. See, because you have to contrast the desires of Paul for women in the church to what was happening with women in the temple. So in verses 9 and 10, he says, I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves with not elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess worship to God. See, ladies who were adorning themselves much like the ladies in that temple were drawing a little too much attention to themselves and not to the one that they had come to worship. A woman virtually indistinguishable from a prostitute further down the road is a detraction from corporate order in their worship, wouldn't you imagine? A woman preoccupied with expensive fashion over the simplicity of worship detracts from her own quiet submission to the word, as Paul recommends further down. In the temple of Artemis, ladies were the authority, so to speak. The church in Ephesus sought to distinguish their women from these prostitutes in every way they could. So Paul says, dress simply. 
Don't let your dress be a point of, of distraction or detraction, not just for the other people in the temple, but maybe for yourselves. Don't get too preoccupied in what you're going to wear to church. <laughs> Uh-oh. <clears throat> And then he finally says here, he says, women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Certainly it doesn't mean that their salvation hinges on whether they have children or not. That's not what he's saying at all. Rather, they can redeem their time by being great caregivers for their family. They can pour into their families at this time. We're really trying to take the helm, speaking out too much, wearing expensive uh, jewelry and clothing and all these things. It's just something that the church is not ready for, especially here in Ephesus. Instead, you can serve the Lord best in this place by taking care of your family, by attending to their spiritual needs by making sure that they are loved. And he says, this is how we keep order here in this church right now. Finally, there's not only, uh, not only in the matter of, of time that it was written, and not only uh, with it being in Ephesus around this temple, but we have to remember also that this is a letter to a leader. This is not some sort of grand letter to a church, some sort of Ten Commandments that you would nail to the wall and have everyone look at. He's giving advice to a leader. He's giving advice to Timothy. And Paul is giving the best he can to give advice to a minister under his care. Paul hadn't intended this to be led, uh, read as a public declaration of the rules for church. <laughs> This passage reminds me a little bit of some advice another minister once gave me. It's actually, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but it just reminds me, sometimes ministers will give you little bits of advice here and there, and one of them said, when you're just starting out, start to change things slowly, okay? Don't do too much too fast. If you, uh, you'll get along just fine if you do little things at a time. Change things too quickly, and the next thing that they will change is you. <clears throat> it's got some truth to it. What we must remember. What I think is important for us to remember is that the culture in which this was written was one in which equality between men and women was virtually unheard of. Just the fact that they worshiped together was strange. And yeah, they were dealing with it on their own time. Is that right? I mean... It, it's not right that that's the way things were, but that was the way things were at that time. See, in the earlier church, just the fact that they were together in the same place was a cosmic shift from the way that they had always done it. Changing the entire leadership structure of the church too quickly would have thrown it into even more chaos and disorder. They were already dealing with a slew of issues stemming from integrating churches of Gentiles and traditional Jews. Uh, as we talked about last week, there were heresies that were popping up in the church, people that were teaching wrong stuff. They were just trying to get a grip of what on earth correct theology was at the time, let alone trying to bring all of these new ideas and new people into the fold. Paul includes the perception as it was based on scriptures in verse 13 and 14. It says, uh, For Adam was formed first and then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. This is kind of something that they had taken with them. The attitude that there was a, 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 an inheritance of authority or there was a, a hierarchy of authority based on that, that was already taken into the church as well. But what might have rocked the boat for Ephesus in this snapshot of time was not, not to be intended to be a general rule for the church as a whole. Paul said, for a season, Timothy, in this season, I, I don't want you to rock the boat too fast. I don't believe that's what Paul says at all. I don't believe that's what he meant at all. Now, what makes me so confident in this assertion to say, I don't think that's what Paul meant when it's written right there in the text? Why do I believe that Paul doesn't want, or uh, Paul does, uh, let me try this one more time. Why do I believe that Paul doesn't mind women leading the church? Because he has women leading the church all over the place in Scripture otherwise. 
He's writing a letter to Ephesus saying, this is how you should conduct worship here because it's just a mess. But think about this for a second. Paul himself was confident in the leadership of women in different contexts. Would you know that the church in Philippi began with a woman? <laughs> her name was Lydia. It began with her conversion with a group of women praying together. Uh, we could almost call that a makeshift synagogue there in Philippi. And, uh, and after she was saved, she invited Paul over to her house and thus began the church in Philippi. A woman named Lydia. Phoebe mentions uh, three women in, in the, the book of Romans. Phoebe, who was a deacon in the church. Uh, Prissa, and, and uh, my favorite is Junia, who was actually an apostle that Paul acknowledged by name. An apostle, Junia. And, uh, and she was even imprisoned with Paul for the work that they were doing, sharing the gospel. Now, why would Paul call her an apostle if she wasn't a leader in the church? One of my favorites, and this isn't Paul, this is just scripture, just to let you know that this is not necessarily just a New Testament thing. My favorite, one of my heroes of scripture is Deborah. Are you familiar with Deborah? Judges chapter 4, it says that uh, God raised up a judge. Now, it doesn't just refer to her as a judge. She was the leader of Israel, <laughs> okay? A woman leading Israel at the time. And it was a time that Israel had strayed from God. They'd, they'd fallen far away from God. And she returned them. She, she actually led military conquest against the king of Canaan and led Israel back to their glory under their God. Tell me. Women aren't supposed to lead. Church, I'm convinced. God did not make women inferior. <laughs> there was a reason for the instructions given to the women of Ephesus and the men as well. The takeaway is this. And this is important. When we are together in worship, when we are together in worship, when we are united, when we are of one mind and one heart and one body, when we are together, may we always operate in the interests of God and not of ourselves. That's really what Paul is saying to us. He says, men, leave your junk out of this, okay? Come with a spirit of waiting to worship God. And he says to the ladies, he says, ladies, I want you to learn. I want you to sit back. I don't want necessarily to cause a stir. And, and in this season, for the benefit of the whole, for the benefit of the body, don't try to take leadership too fast, okay? We're dealing with enough. But God has never seen women as inferior. When we're together in worship, may we always operate in the interests of God and of others. May our hearts be inclined toward one another and toward God so that none of us will be distracted from its true purpose. Church, will you pray with me? God, thank you for this glimpse into Scripture, and thank you for uh, well, thank you for the gift that you've given to so many of us, Lord, the desire to know you, the desire to share you. I thank you for those that you raise up in ministry with the desire to share your story with their lives. May we understand. Well, you made us all in your image. You made us all with a purpose and with a mission. And God, you created us wonderfully and beautifully. And so, God, when we call upon you, would you know that whether we're male or female, and whether we're Jew or whether we're Greek or whatever we are, God, that you don't see us any differently? than simply children of God that you love. And so, God, as we read through these things, God, may we not see any difference between whoever it is that you've called to ministry in the church, but instead recognize the gift that you've given them and the call that you have given them. For, God, we love you. 
We submit to you in this place. We are your people. And God, bury this word deep in our hearts. We pray these things together. And the whole church said, Amen. You are blessed. You are loved. May God follow you. May his Holy Spirit take, a, well, may it take residence in your hearts. And may you share it with those in your reach. Lord, uh, church, you're dismissed. Have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday. Yeah.